So I will talk about transparent snarks from dark compilers. And uh, the main result that I will present in this paper is that uh, we have a new snark without any trusted setup, um, which is very short, so only 10 kilobytes short, whereas previously these starks or snarks without trusted setup were 200 to 600 kilobytes short. And uh, it's also very efficient to verify. And uh, what it uses is something that I will talk about uh, today, which is a polynomial commitment using uh, groups of unknown order. And you can use them without a trusted setup. So uh, I realized that I've given so many snark talks that I actually don't even have a slide about snarks anymore. But what it is is a, it's a, it's a zero knowledge proof. And what it allows you to do in very simple terms is if you have an encrypted transaction, I can prove to you that the transaction is valid, and you can uh, check that the transaction is valid without knowing any of the details. And the, the snark part of it is, is also that it's super efficient. So the verification is super efficient. So what this allows you to do is actually give you a proof that the entire blockchain is correct, and the proof will be you know, maybe like 15 kilobytes or 12 kilobytes, and it will still be you know, maybe 150 milliseconds to check. So you can get a single proof inserting that all of the transactions in the entire blockchain are correct, and checking it is, uh, that proof is, is, is a, few hundred, a few, few kilobytes and is insanely easy to check. So these are very, very powerful tools. But if we look at a recent comparison of these snarks, then uh, you know, they all have some downsides. And, and this slide is, is way too dense to, to, um, to parse, but what uh, I want to take you away from it is that supersonic, what I will introduce today, is the first transparent snark, so it doesn't have this trusted setup, with uh, very short proof sizes and very short verification time. And um, what is the problem with this trusted setup? So a lot of the most efficient snark construction have a trusted setup. And uh, what this means is if the setup can be subverted, so if there's some uh, the person doing the setup, if he's cheating or she's cheating, then uh, and colluding with the prover, then the prover can create pr fake proofs. So he can break math. He can say that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. Why is that a problem? Well, if we use this in a cryptocurrency like Zcash or Monero, then this fake proof can lead to undetectable inflation. I can spend more money than I have, right? And uh, the, the, the zero knowledge property, the fact that everything is encrypted and hidden, will still hold. So I won't even see that new money has been created out of thin air. And the problem is that even sort of the fear of this undetectable inflation is, is kind of dangerous because I don't know whether uh, there's no way to, to, to falsify that actually no such thing, like that the tr trusted setup has been uh, done correctly. Like we can only like look at that, you know, they did the best practices, but we can never really know. And in fact, in, in what you can do is you can have a distributed setup, and there's been a lot of work on, great work on that. Like, so that we say, you know, we get together 10 or 15 people, and as long as one of us is honest, then everything is, is uh, uh, okay. Zcash did that, and they did a, a great job at it, but it turned out they had an implementation bug, so their trusted setup was actually broken. Luckily, they fixed it before it was exploited, or at least so we think, right? We don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they fixed it. There's no evidence that it was broken, but we, the problem is we don't know, right? We can't definitively say. And uh, the other problem with snarks, or at least the older kinds of snarks, is that every time I want to create a snark for a new functionality, I need a new trusted setup, right? So if I, there was this proposal for a hawk, where every smart contract is private and it's, 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 it's amazing and beautiful and so on. But the problem is every single smart contract needed a new trusted setup. And if any one of them is broken, then we have a problem. So this is really uh, and, uh, not feasible. And so what we introduced today is a snark that has all the good properties of, of snarks but does not require this trusted setup. Um, and uh, the snark is called supersonics. So, how does that work? I actually want to explain to you today, uh, I want you to get an understanding of how this tool actually works. So what we're going to use is a, is a so-called polynomial commitment. And if you saw Alessandro Keza's talk yesterday, there's a lot of uh, similarities here. Um, and I will explain why. So a polynomial commitment is a cryptographic commitment. So this is the C, a small value. So even if I commit to a huge polynomial, remember a polynomial is like, uh, 
3 plus x plus 5x squared minus 7x cubed and so on. We're doing that over, over a finite field. Um, and so what I can do is even though the, commit, the polynomial is potentially long, I can commit to it in a, in a constant size value, a couple hundred bytes maybe, and then the verifier can challenge uh, at a point z, and then I can give you the evaluation of that uh, at that point z, so I can give you f of z equals to y, and a proof that this evaluation was done correctly. So you can check, I can basically outsource the evaluation of this polynomial. And recently, there was, uh, uh, in, in uh, the end of 2018, um, uh, Mahler and others introduced this proof system called Sonic, which is a new kind of snark because it uses only polynomial commitments and the trust is really only in these polynomial commitments. And uh, so there's a, only a one-time trusted setup. So it doesn't have the problem of, of Hawk anymore where I need to do a trusted setup for every functionality. Uh, I only need to do it once. And this is uh, what uh, uh, Ale talked about yesterday. And in particular, he talked about Marlin which is an improvement to uh, Sonic, and Planck is another improvement to Sonic. So all of these proof systems just use polynomial commitments. So what this means is that if we can come up with a new polynomial commitment, which doesn't have a trusted setup, we have a trusted snark. The, so that is exactly what we did. So what is it? A dark proof, it's this polynomial commitment. It's a Diophatine argument of knowledge. Why Diophatine? Because it's, uh, it works over the integers. And uh, it uses these so-called class groups, but the important key factors is that if I want to evaluate the polynomial, I can give you a proof which is logarithmic in the size of uh, the degree of the polynomial. So it's a polynomial with a million terms. I can give you a proof that has like 20 or 40, 40 elements, and checking it also takes only like 40 operations or something like that. And the most important thing is it doesn't have a trusted setup. So what does this give us? Well, sonic plus dark, gives us supersonic, uh, right? We just plug the dark polynomial commitment into sonic, and we get supersonic, which is a snark with short proofs and no trusted setup. And if we use Plonk, this improvement of sonic, we get proof sizes of, of less than eight kilobytes at 100-bit security, and I think it's 10 kilobytes at 120-bit security. Um, and... Uh, the way that we do that is, is really using, using the so-called pipeline. So what you do is you, you express your computation as an arithmetic circuit. So what is an arithmetic circuit? It's basically just a bunch of, uh, you know, you say uh, which gates do I add and which gates do I multiply. So I, I just formulate it in terms of additions and multiplications. I can do that for any program. Then I use this thing called a polynomial IOP, which is Sonic is one of them, but there's a bunch of other ones, uh, and actually implicitly they've existed before Sonic, but like you can see very recently there's been a ton of new uh, snarks which you can really think of as these polynomial IOPs, I'll explain what they are. And then this is the information theoretic part, and then I use a, a, a cryptographic compiler, we call it the, the polynomial commitment, to make this into an interactive argument, so they're the prover and this verify send each other messages, and then there is another cryptographic trick which can sort of squash the interaction and make the interactive argument into something that is non-interactive. What does that mean? Well, the prover can just write down the proof and you can read it and check it and make sure that it is correct. So what is this polynomial IOP? Well, the idea is that, that the prover sends to the verifier sort of polynomial oracles. So he sends these, these polynomials and then the verifier can uh, query these polynomials um, and get evaluations of the polynomial. So this doesn't really exist because or it's not you know, efficient necessarily because sending these oracles would be very expensive. But what we can then later do is, is replace them with uh, polynomial commitments. Um, and uh, I can also you know, pre-process some of the, you know, I can express my circuit, so my computation, as polynomials and uh, already pre process some of them such that I have efficient access to them. And then, you know, we, we, we go along and the prover sends some polynomials, the verifier sends some challenges, and in the end, uh, the verifier accepts or rejects. And uh, so the pipeline is that we take this polynomial IP, then we use a commitment to replace all of these polynomials, which 
The prover then will just send a commitment to a polynomial instead of the actual polynomial. And the challenges now, are like evaluating the polynomial becomes an evaluation proof. So the prover convinces you that the polynomial evaluated at this point is in fact this value. And then we use this Fiat-Shamir transform to compile this interactive protocol to a non-interactive one, where basically the idea is that instead of the verifier generating these challenges, I can just generate them from a hash function. And since hash function, you know, if we assume they look sort of random, the output of them, then uh, this works. So instead of um, alpha being sampled by, it's just a random number, instead of it being sampled by the verifier, we'll just hash all of the previous messages and generate the, hash, the, the challenge from that. So uh, what we showed and what Marlon and at the same time sort of also showed is that, that if we have a polynomial IOP, we can make it into a, into a snark. And um, there, as I said already, there exist now multiple polynomial IOPs. So for example, in, 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 in uh, Sonic, they, they present exactly a, a, a polynomial IOP for all of NP. What does that mean really for, for any computation you can think of? There exist these polynomial IOPs. So you know, no matter what language we want to have a snark for, um, we can create an, uh, uh, we can create a snark for it using this recipe of polynomial IOPs and polynomial commitments. And in the end, what this gives us using different, we can see here that sort of different polynomial IOPs will give us different, uh, different snarks. So for example, Sonic is uh, actually not the, the, the smallest, Plonk seems to be a little bit smaller. But uh, what this also means is that if someone comes up with a new polynomial IOP, they can directly plug it in. And right, they only need to, to work and improve this polynomial IOP, and it will directly give us a better snark. Right? There's, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between better polynomial IOPs and better snarks. So what does this uh, construction look like? And the thing that I will focus on is this polynomial commitment. So uh, remember, right, this is what a polynomial looks like. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to, uh, there usually we think of these polynomials or we, we, we want a polynomial modulo some, some prime p, so in the field fp. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent it over the integers. So obviously every number between a mod p is, is I can map to an integer between zero and p minus one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a q and this q is larger than p, and then I'm just going to evaluate the polynomial f at q over the integers. So let's make this very concrete. This may sound a little bit uh, weird, but it's actually just a very simple thing. So say I have this polynomial, 4x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 3, and my p is equal to 5. So then I'm just going to evaluate it at 10, right? 10 is greater than 5. I could have also chosen 100 or, or another point. But what this gives us is, what this gives me is, it gives me 4213, 4,213. So basically it just gives me the coefficients listed uh, next to each other. And what it turns out is that, that um, this is a unique encoding, a unique representation of the polynomial as an integer, right? I can map any polynomial of this form, I can map to an integer, and there's, uh, you know, for a unique polynomial in this range, there's a unique integer which, uh, which represents that polynomial. So um, the uh, interesting thing is that, that, that this, this f of q is still large, right? If my polynomial has four terms, then, you know, in this case, the, the integer will have four digits, but we can deal with that in a second. So this doesn't have any space savings. It's just mapping polynomials to integers. And uh, there's some, this, this is basically just the, the, the properties of the polynomial commitment that every integer uniquely, is uniquely decodable. So from every integer, I can then also map back to a polynomial, right? I can just look at 4, 2, 1, 3, and I know exactly what polynomial that corresponds to, right? This kind of corresponds to 4x cubed plus 2x uh, squared plus 1 x plus 3. Um, so the, the uh, nice thing is that this encoding also has some really powerful properties. So it is so-called 
homomorphic. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if I take the encoding of two polynomials and I add them, then this gives me the same thing as if I added the polynomial and then encoded it. If Q is large enough, we, we, you know, we have to deal with these overflows, but let's ignore them for a second. So example, f of 10 is 4, 2, 1, 3, 4, 2, 3, 1, and g of 10 is 4, 1, 4, 4, 3. So uh, what this gives us, you know, if I add these integers together, I get 5, 6, 7, 4, which is equal to, you know, it's the encoding of 5x cubed plus 6x squared plus 7x plus 4, uh, which is the same thing that I would have gotten if I just added the polynomials and then evaluated at 10. So um, the nice thing is also that it uh, gives me so-called monomial homomorphism. So I can also multiply the polynomial by x to the k, right? So I can shift the, all of the, the, the terms by x to the k, and that just corresponds to multiplying by q to the k. So say if I want to multiply by x squared, I multiply by 10 squared, which is 100, right? And this gives me 5, 6, 7, 4, 0, 0. It just adds some zeros. Um, so the problem now is, right, these, these integers, this hasn't given us any space saving. We want to represent the polynomial into, in a small number uh, and somehow compress it. So this is where cryptography comes in and something called a group of unknown order. So uh, this group is, is, uh, uh, has several properties, but uh, the most important thing is that I don't know how many elements are in this group, in this, this set. Um, and it also has uh, homomorphism. So what this means, so how do I map to an integer? What I can do is I can map an integer to a small group element. So the way that I do that is just g to the, computing g to the x. And g to the x, for any x, has basically the same size. It's a constant representation. Even if x is huge, even if x has millions of digits, g to the x is constant size. In, in, in our case, this would be like 1,200 bits. So or uh, maybe 150 bytes, right? No matter what, how large x is. The nice thing is that the map is homomorphic. So if I have g to the x and g to the y, then this corresponds to, uh, and if I multiply g to the x times g to the y, then this corresponds to g to the x plus y. These are just uh, exponentiation laws. So if I encode an integer x, and I encode, I, like, I use this, this, this group of uh, unknown order to, encode an integer x and an integer y, then I can still add these integers and get an encoding of the, the added integer. So the nice thing is now we, we have this, you know, we, we have this homomorphism twice, right? We have, uh, first we can lift our polynomial to an uh, integer by evaluating it at the point q, and then I can use the homomorphism in the group uh, to basically uh, it, it carries forward. So if I've done this, if I did this procedure twice for two polynomials and then added them, or if I added the polynomials first and then did this procedure of committing to it, I would get exactly the same result. So uh, what do these groups of unknown order look like? Well, uh, they, I want you uh, to not worry too much about this slide, but basically we have them uh, they're so-called class groups, and the nice thing is that they do not require a trusted setup. But how does, um, how can I now use this commitment scheme, right? This is the, this is the commitment scheme that I want to use. How can I use this to be, build a polynomial commitment, right? I know how to, uh, well, actually, I know how to commit to a polynomial now, but I now need to also efficiently evaluate the polynomial at a point. This is really the crux now, right? So. Let's think of it, you know, this is the, the intuition of the protocol. So what we're going to do is we're going to build uh, a logarithmic uh, protocol. And basically, if you think of a logarithmic protocol, you should always think recursion or, you know, something splitting into two halves and then continuing with one of them or with a combination of them. And that's exactly what we'll do. So we'll split a polynomial into a left half and to a right half. So uh, into two polynomials, FL of x, plus x to the d over 2 times fr of x is equal to f of x. And then the prover, you know, just uh, as an intuition, it sends uh, these polynomials or oracles to these polynomials to the verifier. And the verifier sends a challenge alpha back. 
And that what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, combine these polynomials. So we're going to compute f prime of x is equal to fl of x plus alpha times fr of x. So it's a random linear combination of these polynomials. But the interesting thing is that what does this give us? Well, this gives us f prime of x, which is of half the degree than what we started with. So we started with degree d polynomials, and we ended up with degree d over 2 polynomials. And then we can just repeat, right? We can just repeat log, uh, log d times until we get a constant size polynomial. And I'll tell you in a second what we do once we get to the base case. But uh, you know, reduction by 2 always gives us a, a logarithmic protocol. So uh, what we really do, though, right? we don't want to do this over the integers, because these are expensive to send. So we're uh, going to apply our, our commitment trick to lift everything to group elements. right? So let's go back here. You see f, f l of x gets lifted to g to the uh, f l of q. Right? We encode it as an integer and then use the group operation. But the nice thing is all of the homomorphisms still apply, so we can run exactly the same protocol. Um, there's a couple challenges here. So the verifier actually needs to check that uh, this, this C is equal to um, F of X, or that you know, the left half and the right half have the right property. Um, so it needs to check uh, that, uh, you know, it needs to check this equation, C equals CL times CR to the Q to the D over two. This checks sort of the second line. And then I also need to evaluate the polynomial at a point. But that is easy, because I can just send these values in parallel. So I claim that f of x is equal to, uh, at z is equal to uh, y mod p. And then I just can, you know, for each of the polynomials, so for fl and fr, I just send you the evaluations mod p. So I send you fl z mod p and fr z mod p. And then the verifier can, you know, check that y YL and YR have the right relation, and it can compute you know, uh, the, the evaluation, the claimed evaluation of F prime of X. So it can compute Y prime, which is just the random linear combination of YL and YIR using the challenge alpha. So uh, this is basically the whole protocol. There is one challenge here, which is this uh, green box next to the verifier. The verifier needs to check right, the, the, the second line of the statement. And it turns out that this is an expensive check. So why is this expensive? Well, I need to compute CR to the Q to the D over 2. And Q to the D over 2 is a huge number. It's as large as the, my polynomial, the original description of my polynomial. So I, don't really, I can't really do that exponentiation. That turns out to be very, very expensive. So we can use something that I'm not going to go into, but it's called this pr proof of exponentiation, which was developed uh, last year by Benjamin Veselovsky. And this actually came up in the research of uh, verifiable delay functions. So if you heard of verifiable delay functions, it's, it's, basically, it's exactly the same thing. Um, so it's a, it's a proof that someone computed an exponentiation with a huge exponent correctly. And the nice thing is that I can efficiently verify that this exponentiation was done correctly. The other challenge is that uh, basically my coefficients, every time I do a random linear com combination, my coefficients grow, right? You know, they grow a little bit. I, I multiply, you know, if I compute uh, 3 plus 4, that's larger than uh, 3 or, or 4. Um, but also, if I multiply it by a random alpha, then you know these these things grow a little bit. They grow by a factor of alpha. Um, and it turns out, though, that because we only have a logarithmic number of rounds, the coefficients won't get too large, or I know kind of exactly how large they are. Um, but what I need to do in the final step is I need to ensure that uh, so that in the final step the polynomial is just a constant degree polynomial, so it's just a constant. Um, and the prover just sends over this polynomial. And then the verifier can check that this is, in fact, small, or that it is, in fact, of the expected size. And that uh, also, you know, it's the correctly committed polynomial, and that f of 0 is equal to y mod p. And uh, if we show in the paper, and I encourage you to, to you know, we, we wrote this technical overview section, which 
is, I think, uh, hopefully, it's, it's easier to comprehend than the rest of the paper, so I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, but if we do these check, then this really implies that the rest of the protocol is okay. And um, the, I'm basically done. So the, the protocol has a lot of, you know, there's a lot of optimizations that we explain, a lot of batching tricks, um, which get us to this low proof number. And uh, you can find all of them in the paper. And the paper is online uh, at ePrint 2019. One, two, two, nine, I think. Yeah, that is terrible font coloring of choices here. But yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah. How much does this improve on the previous status of the art? So the, the previous, like a Stark is, is for the same size circuit is maybe 600 kilobytes, and uh, this is 10 kilobytes. So effect, and uh, asymptotically it gets you from something that is log squared or log cubed to uh, something that is uh, purely logarithmic. But yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>